The world is a heavy place these days. Fires out west, political unrest, climate change, the interim final rule. Oh, I feel it heavy, all of it in my heart. And I feel disconnected from, from lots of things. So what I intend to do today is try to reconnect. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Harlock. And today, we're going on a road trip. First stop is going to be Paradise Hemp Farm down in southern Chester County. Let's go. Good morning, Eric. Thanks Good morning. For, thanks for having me down to your farm today. You're the first stop on my uh, Hemp Tour 2020. Thank you for coming. Appreciate yeah. it. Paradise Farms is, uh, is that the name of the Paradise farm? Paradise Hemp Farm. Paradise Hemp Farm is my first stop on my hemp road trip. So how's it going here? What what are we looking at? So, uh, well, thanks for coming out. Uh, this is one of our fields. This is a field of CBD plants. Uh, these rows here, these eight rows are sour space candy. Uh, there's a break and then there's uh, eight rows of super haze. These are genetics from Oregon CBD that we chose. Um, you know, we're, we're happy with how they've performed. If you see here, I'm six feet tall and many of these plants are uh, taller than I am. Uh, that's also a result of we planted in mid June. Uh, and so we expected that we were gonna have uh, larger size plants. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, generally everything has performed pretty well. Uh, this is a CBD field. Behind you is a field of CBG plants, also Oregon CBD genetics. And we're happy with how those plants have grown as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you see here, we have our, our flowers starting to form, um, you know, trico trichome development, resin glands. Um, you know, if you walk around and you touch enough of them, you'll see, okay. you'll, if you walk around and touch enough of them, you'll have uh, sticky hands afterward, um, sticky, stinky hands <laughs> afterward. <laughs> uh, so what kind of challenges have you had this year? Uh, so first challenge was uh, heavy rainfalls uh, earlier in the summer. Uh, thankfully, those heavy rains were earlier in the summer, but definitely we had one event where we, we received about six inches of rain in four hours, and it just it just washed out a couple of our areas, knocked hundreds of plants over. If you see, we have stakes now. Um, almost every plant is, uh, is individually staked up with a bamboo stake, and that's as a result of a lot of plants getting knocked over. And then more recently, in a, more big, a bigger challenge, is uh, caterpillar damage. Uh, caterpillars and just other bugs crawling over our, our, our buds, our colas, and eating them. You know, I just had in my hand and dropped it a moment ago. I mean, it's just a tiny little bug that, you know, if, if I didn't scoop it out of the plant, we'll just go ahead and really wreak havoc. And uh, so we're just going through our plants, quality control one by one, uh, cutting out any caterpillar spots, trying to find as many bugs as we can, squish them, remove them. Um, yeah, again, quality control, you know, right. just going through everything meticulously. And once they are harvested, hopefully within the next few weeks or so, do it all again, meticulously observe and analyze everything before it goes into our drying space. Uh, make sure that we remove any presence of molds, mildews, anything that's going to be problematic uh, in the drying area. Yeah. All right. And then so after it's dried, what, what's the plan for the crop? So we're, we're going to harvest as much as we can for uh, flower uh for smokable flour uh, we plan to hang dry dry uh, what's called low and slow where we're not uh, overheat we're not going to heat the the crop at all we're not going to do any machine drying we're going to be ventilating the space as well as possible dehumidifying the space as well as possible um, and drying our crop in a way that's designed to uh, preserve terpenes preserve flavor pervert, per, uh, preserve uh, the odor um, and uh, the nice experience that you get uh, from, from smoking or dry vaping uh, the flower. Okay. Um, so this is your first year growing, right? Yes. And you practiced law before that. Yes. Any regrets by, you know, for trading in the, uh, the, the law job for a farmer job? Not, no, <laughs> none, none at all. Um, no, I wouldn't go back to it. Uh, just being out uh, the 14 acre farm versus an office setting. Uh, is incomparable. Um, every profession has challenges, no matter what you do. Um, I have found the challenges of, of hemp farming and growing 
to simply be uh, more enjoyable than the challenges of practicing law. Um, Would you recommend all lawyers give up lawyering and, and start growing hemp? <laughs> no, no. There are plenty of lawyers that love what they do uh, and should continue to do what they do. And the cannabis world certainly needs lawyers as well. Um, but I, I certainly don't miss the daily grind of what I was doing before. I don't miss uh, waking up to emails, uh, you know, worrisome, concerning emails that need my immediate response. Um, no, I don't, I don't miss that at all. That was Eric Trachtenberg from Paradise Hemp Farm in West Grove, Pennsylvania. Now we're gonna shoot on over to Kennett Square and meet with Cynthia at Hemp Alternative. Hi, Cynthia. Thanks Hi. for having me out to the farm today. Yeah, this thanks is my, for coming. Yeah, this is my second stop on my Hemp Tour 2020. So how are things going here at your hemp operation? Great, great. We just started our state testing and some of our harvesting. So we'll be testing and harvesting every 15 days in a bit of a rotational um, effort to make sure that we get everything out at the, the highest quality and quantity, but of course not jeopardize the the compliance. Right. Um, and how many acres are you growing? So um, acre-wise, uh, I would go plant plant-wise. We have about 9,000 CBD plants and we have about 1,000 um, CBG. And so we have those across three different farms. So it depends on sort of how the farmers space their plants right, in terms right. of how many acres we're growing. Okay. And what sort of challenges have you been facing this year? Yeah, I think some of the largest challenges um, are following the new USDA guidelines um, that Pennsylvania has uh, has picked up. And that's just relative to making sure that we're following all the rules and staying compliant. And, um, you know, testing is kind of an expensive thing. So we've got that to deal with, too. So any pest pressure that you've been dealing with? Of course, we've had plenty of spotted lantern flies. Um, actually, don't think they've been doing any damage, but recently now we have, you know, the caterpillars are showing up, so okay. we're treating for that. Okay, what are you doing for that? It's a BT solution that they put on them in the evenings. Right, and then so um, you you mentioned when we were walking around about the testing that it seems sort of like a innovative way to to test where you're having the state test certain plants that are ready and then what they'll come back can well, you explain that a bit actually um the way our plants didn't have as much consistency as we had hoped as they were maturing in the field so just to mitigate the risk we've actually developed our own rotational schedule so we have the state out they test we have 15 days to harvest we go through and harvest those that we believe are the most mature and ready to come out of the field and then we line up our second round of testing and then go back through and harvest a second round in terms of what we think ready to mature at that time and um, it actually helps because our it spreads out our drying and our bagging anyway and we're making sure we get the most volume and quality out of the plant before we run into a risk of any um, THC issues so uh, it's just um, maybe if you had a more consistent varietal you wouldn't feel the need to do that but I just felt more comfortable doing that. And then you, you built a, a dryer. Can you describe yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, so last year we modified a hay dryer to basically dry the buds that were bucked off the plants. And this year we've decided to move that into a mobile unit. So we have a box trailer that's now been built out. Uh, think of it as an air hockey table, basically inside of the box trailer. And so that allows us to not only dry the plants here at our sort of home farm, but we can also take that out to our Amish subcontracted farm Farmer, and then we have a grow in Maryland, about 3,500 plants in Maryland. So we'll take it down there too. So they'll wet bucket in the field. They'll fill up the uh, the, the flat bed, and then we'll turn that on and uh, dry the plants that way. About 500 pounds uh, every time it runs. Okay. And then what's the sort of final plan for the harvest? What are you yeah. going to use it for? Yeah, so um, typically we would uh, work to pull out the oil and turn that to distillate or isolate and, and add that to our inventory from last year. But this year we're also looking at uh, perhaps some of our uh, plants that have may have some seeds where we may be doing some experiments with that and kind of looking at what that takes to either press the oil out of the seed or use those seeds for, you know, the marketplace um, okay. yeah, from a protein perspective. Have you had any trouble finding a processor? 
No, actually, um, I think I kicked the tires on enough of them last year to know who we want to work with this year. I am going to introduce some new Maryland processors this year because I don't want to bring that crop across the state line. That's a 2014 farm bill in Maryland. Oh, okay. So we're only looking at Delta 9 from a THC perspective. So I will find some processors in Maryland to handle the Maryland grow. Okay. Um, yeah. um, what else should I ask you about? Maybe just the fiber trial. Oh, yeah, so you did do fiber this year. We Tell did, me about yeah. that. Yeah, so we did a study with uh, Stroudwater Research Center. It will actually be a three- to five-year study, and this was year one. We had grown some fiber last year, so we picked up some experience. But this year we're working with them, just a, a small three-acre. We ended up with three-and-a-half uh, good-sized round bales. And they're studying, um, you know, how that fiber can fit into a rotational crop in farming. What does it do? to the soil and how does it uh, how does it help keep our waters clean and then we'll take that harvest and work with Jefferson University's design engineer and commerce college and we're looking to develop sustainable products with that harvest so that's probably a good year-long project right. um, and we'll be looking for you know some investment behind as we go through the lab at Jefferson and develop alternatives for the marketplace so the key there will be to find sustainable products that uh, we have an audience of customers who are willing to pay a little more to save the earth, right? So, so some of the products that you can use herd or, or best for, um, they're not going to compete in the marketplace. And if, if that audience isn't willing to pay a little more to save the earth, you're never going to even get your pilot off the ground. Where in this case, I think we've targeted uh, some of the work in the horticulture field where people want to save the earth. Mm -hmm. And if they can pay a little more, help us get our products developed. And then eventually with scale, over time, those prices will come down um, and I think that's kind of a, a trick to get go get going in the, in the market today and build some demand okay you're also on the steering committee for the state. Yes. Can you tell me about the work you're doing there Absolutely, and how yeah. that's going? So I'm a co-lead with Josh on the subcommittee that is called Research Opportunities and Needs. That's Josh Lidecker. Yes, from Susquehanna Mills. And so our focus there is to really be an advisory uh, group to the state ag department. So uh, we work together with, uh, they have a business development group and a regulation group uh, and, and a group that is the voice of the farmer. And so together, we bring issues to um, senior management to kind of take a, a look and see, if, you know, for instance, the USDA is opening uh, for comments again. So how can we influence through thinking around sort of what it feels like to be in the field and some of the challenges and what will help us grow this business if we can get the regs fine-tuned. So uh, that's what our goal is. Cool. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot on your plate. Yeah, so thanks yeah. for taking time today to, sure. to meet me out here at the farm. Thanks for coming. Yeah. So that was Cynthia Patron Hudock at Hemp Alternative in Kennett Square. Now we're going to uh, head west a little bit on out to Lancaster County. We're going to stop at Oakley Farm where Tim and Sarah from King's Agri-Seed are going to show me around their, uh, their test farm where they're growing many varieties of hemp. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is my third stop today on my hemp tour in Lancaster and Chester counties. So uh, could you introduce yourselves? I am uh, Tim Fritz, the owner of King's Agri-Seeds, and I am a, a, an agronomist by training. And uh, yeah, this is our second year of research of hemp on this farm. And I'm Sarah Mitchell. I am the industrial hemp specialist with King's Agri-Seeds. Okay, well, thanks for having me out to uh, your your operation here. So tell me a little bit about what's happening here. This is like a, a test plot, right? This is a test plot in this particular spot where we're standing. We are looking at photosensitive varieties. We have potential introductions, about eight numbered varieties that could be on the market, but probably may, of course, may not be. There may be one, possibly two, that could be introduced in 2021. This one is, uh, called Spectrum. This is currently on the market and one of the varieties that we sold for photosensitive for this for this season. Okay, and where are you sourcing your your seeds from? Or is that, you work with Phylos exclusively? Uh, no, we work with Phylos as one of our suppliers and that's in the auto CBD right now. Oh, okay. And we're also working with uh, this variety Spectrum is by Atlas? Flora. Flora, Flora. I'm Flora, sorry. okay. Flora. All right. I know Atlas. Do you work with them too? 
we are we are in in discussion right okay cool so what sorts of challenges have you had out here this year i think we've had typical challenges of of most growers number one would be uh, how to get the crop seeded or started initially and number two would be learning to monitor this crop and respond and probably the biggest problem is weed control yeah so what have you done for weed control oh so so for autoflower that's where we have the biggest con concern about weed control because we're trying to do direct seeding in the soil and you have a plant that's being planted at a relatively low population it was recommended to us to seed at 10,000 seeds uh, per acre corn typically around here is seeded at 30,000 oh. so that's a pretty thin population that's one you, the goal was to get one plant every 18 inches in a 30 inch row so you know you're going to have weeds so that is our biggest challenge and bottom line we tried various uh techniques for controlling weeds and we do like the idea of planting in a 30 inch row doing some sort of form of cultivation in our research pots that was in the form of a rototiller and then after about a month doing a interseeding of uh, different ideas and I think I'm going to recommend a, a, a broad mix that we're, we're developing for this in the future uh, not just one component because you never know what the weather is going to be. So is that like a, a cover crop? It's not hemp, but it would be in there to suppress the it weeds? Would, it would be an interseeding to help control erosion between the rows when you get heavy storms. The weeds, at that point, the weeds are going to be less of a problem. Uh, but uh, up front, I think we need some sort of tillage. We actually tried flaming as well. Mm -hmm. And we tried uh, a couple organic approved herbicides. How many different growers have you sold hemp seeds to? Like how many people are you working with? We've sold, we've sold hemp in uh, five states. Oh, okay. So from small growers to larger growers, from large farms to just greenhouse operations, from people who have just never grown anything before, to people who have, who have, if, if there can be a veteran farmer, right. we've, we've sold to some, to some growers who, who do know what they're, what they're up against. Okay. Can you ballpark like what percentage of your business now is hemp? Is it still relatively small compared to all the other seeds uh, that you sell? In the King's Agri Seed System, yeah. it's a very low percentage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we did, we did okay considering this year and we started in the grain hemp world, grain hmm. slash fiber. Mm -hmm. So the CBD is new this year. And last year we had a lot of success because there were not very many people selling at that time. We actually sold the whole way out to California last year. Okay. This year it was more regionalized because there's a better distribution network. But even with the, the grain and fiber weeds are a major issue. And I've been working on some other projects uh, with that, um, some concepts. I'm not ready to really discuss them yet because uh, had some success this last year with those concepts and this year they were uh, not so good. Okay. So we're still learning. Yeah. Uh, like everybody else. Right. We're still learning. <laughs> okay. Um, how will you do things differently next year? Well, for starters, we are planning a little better where we're going to plant our crop. So in 2019, Tim did some, some plantings where he had particular cover crops that overwintered and found weed suppression as well as hemp encouragement based on the different mixtures. So we are already starting there by planting cover crop, planting cover crops where we intend to plant hemp for 2021. Okay. And I am, I think farmers need to be looking to the future and thinking about where their crop rotations are going to come from. So that's number one. And I think number two, we will just learn from our mistakes. We will definitely be learning from our mistakes and, and not making not making some of them. Okay. So. Um, between the autoflower and the photosensitive stuff, um, what's more popular with your customers? Uh, we started out early with the autoflower. 
I think that there are a lot of advantages to growing autoflower, mainly that you can schedule your labor, schedule your planting, schedule your harvest, kind of ladder the whole season. Mm -hmm. And here in the east, uh, you can actually take advantage or I guess avoid some of the risks by planting multiple crops with yeah. the weather. Yeah. So I think that is, I think that's a powerful advantage. And then of course you can schedule your harvest to come in ahead of the photosensitive crops. So the growers who have harvested, their auto flowers are doing very well in the marketplace right now for for smokable flower. Okay. So our customers are, are fairly pleased. If yeah. Um, what other sort of insect pressure have you had here? Because I saw a spotted lanternfly <laughs> land on your shoulder there. Spotted lanternfly seems to seem to be attracted to just about anything. <laughs> so it, it does seem to like this too. Are they doing any damage? Not that I can see. Okay. Not that I can see. Um, some other growers I talked to today had some caterpillar pressure yeah. in, in the buds. Is that happening here too? Yes. Yeah. And what do you do for that? Uh, we, we, don't do, we don't do anything. Um, we had insect pressure at the beginning mm -hmm. with grasshoppers eating the seedlings. That was in July when it got really hot and dry. Oh, yeah. So we lost, we, even though we had good emergence, we lost plants there. We've had um, army worm, mm. considerable amount of army worm that feeds on the bug, buds. We've had yellow woolly bear caterpillar feeding on the leaves. And we've had some corn earworm, but mm. not to the, not very much of that. Okay. And the question about what are we doing about it, in reality, this is a research farm. We have so many varieties, experimental varieties on this farm. There's no way we could pull off a commercial sale of this. It'd be, have to have all the testing done for each variety. Mm -hmm. So we will not be marketing this product. It will be a terminated project. That was my next question, what's going to happen? to it, but you're just going to what, compost it or? going to go back into the land. Okay. Do you then still have to get it tested? No, we need to document that we've destroyed it. Okay. Yeah. All right. But you don't need the state to come out and test? No, no, and... no, okay. no but we do have to document right. that we destroyed it. The destruction. It. Okay. And what is your method of destruction? Well, our grain and fiber material, we simply mowed off. Okay. Uh, and I believe that's probably what we'll do to this. Yeah. Too. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, anything to just kill it and, and mowing's the easiest. We have a real nice double reciprocating sickle bar mower that cuts right through this stuff. Uh, no problem at all. Okay. All right, well, hey, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me out. Um, and also, thank you for your sponsorship over the past, uh, I guess, a year or so. You guys have been sponsoring our podcast, and I appreciate that. It's been a pleasure. We, we like to support anything educational for learning new crops and continuing our education. I Excellent. think that's probably one of the key distinctions between King's Agri-Seeds and other hemp seed suppliers is that we are working with farmers who, who have more on their farm than, than just hemp. Yeah. So working on building up the soil, looking at their crop rotations, also helping to um, get best cultivation practices as well as represent really good breeders that's that's kind of where where we fit is in a, a larger spectrum tying in with our other with our other products and our other business it's a good business model good and all I'm right just going to add one other yeah thing sure uh, you, we, you mentioned testing we are testing but we're not testing for sale okay we're testing for research sure at various time points okay all right, well, Tim and Sarah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Our fourth stop today is out to Holtwood, Pennsylvania. Southern Lancaster County. Right place. We're going to meet up with Steve Groff. You know Steve, he's been on the show before. Hey, Steve. Good. How you doing? We're doing good. Good. So uh, thanks for having me out to your farm. This is my fourth stop on my hemp road trip 2020. All right. So... Uh, Appreciate you bringing me out here. Um, so, how's the season going? We've had a, a little dry weather there in July, uh, and then it got a little wet, and now it'd be like, please, just nice days through the rest of September for our hemp crop here, because 
we don't like the foggy days like we had the last couple times, yeah. a couple days. So, so far, I think we've had a decent year. Good. Um, so what's your plan for harvest? When When's this stuff coming down? Well, it looks like in a, in a, in a 10 days or two weeks. So, so uh, I have a bunch of varieties here I'm testing. So there's a little bit of a overlap and also they're spaced apart a little bit. So right. more or less over the next, uh, well, in, in about two weeks, over the next several weeks, then we'll be, uh, we'll be working on harvesting this. Okay. And how's it going with like the state testing? Any issues there? Well, um, I guess you could say we've had a few issues. Um, the testing is certainly not consistent uh, from test to test. And, uh, you know, with that being said, I, I think there's still a work in progress of, of nailing this down. Of course, I'm a proponent of let's just make it 1% and, um, and let's just make this just easier for everybody. And it's, it accomplishes the same purpose. Yeah, so, take the burden off the farmer. Yeah, so that's frustrating, and and I would say that uh, I was very happy to hear the USDA has opened up the comment period. Nothing else, I see that as a positive sign, meaning they're willing at least to hear and listen. And I think farmers are frustrated enough now with the testing aspect, with the the harvest window they're giving us. It really does not work in real in real world. Uh, I mean, just for instance, the last three days here, I couldn't harvest if I had to because it's been wet. You can't harvest wet hemp. And uh, the, from the time they test till you get your test back, and then until you get your clearance letter, sometimes it's weeks. Yeah. So that's that's been that's been a problem. Um, I think it's being addressed, but we'll um, we'll hope for the best. Let's see, right? Have you heard of any farmers having to destroy crops because they're hot? I have heard I have heard of some, um, and I know that that's kind of being a, a little bit of a work in progress there. And that's one of the contentions too, because. In the context of, uh, of everything here, we know that we can take the THC out of processing. So I know that's one of the things that they want to get involved with is trying to have other options to, to instead of destroying it, to actually use it. And, and then I understand there's going to have to be some follow through with that. But, you know, and, and, and here I am, I'm testing new varieties. Um, there's not many people out there doing that. And what if I get a variety that in all good conscience, it tends to be hot? Am I going to be penalized for that? And that's just some of the questions I'm asking uh, in the context of all this. Yeah. Um, apart from some of the weather issues, uh, how about like weed pressure or insect pressure? So um, I haven't seen much problems with insect pressure. Um, and as far as weed pressure, you always have weeds, no matter how you grow. Uh, and so it takes some time and effort, money, expense, whatever to control the weeds. And now with you know plenty of moisture, the weeds grow too. And so we just had to try to keep up with that. I've got a little behind in some acres, but as you can see right here, this stuff's pretty good. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're on top of it, uh, okay. but I don't think I'm ahead of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last time we talked, you had mentioned um, your own sort of vertical integration and your own brand. How's that going? Yeah, so I am coming out with my own brand, uh, cedarmeadow.farm is the brand and um, we're actually using our dog here as a mascot, our dog Grizzly. He's not gonna pose for you now, but uh, <laughs> so uh, so anyway, it's, it's, it's coming together, but I know why a lot of people don't do this, because it's hard. Mm. It really is to get everything lined up from extraction to bottling and, 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 and everything is, is tough. And I, I fully understand that it's a crowded market out there, but I really wanted to take things kind of under my own uh, to determine my own future sure. rather than just sit on biomass for a year. Uh, don't want to do that again. Do you still have some from last year? We're still going through some of last year's stuff and we're just about ready to harvest this. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that didn't work out like we thought last year, but we'll see how this brand works and we're looking forward to it. But um, what kind of products are you making? So we're going to initially start focusing on the pet market uh, for pet CBD uh, and, and, you know, working with, uh, various aspects in that whole realm, but we're also going to have for people as well, of course. Uh, and then we're going to get into the salves and creams for people and, and the, some of the different, and as we, as we grow and as we get established, you know, it's, um, life would be easy if we had all the money in the world. <laughs> uh, I know that's not the answer to anything, but we're going to bootstrap this pretty much. Yeah. And, uh, as, as hopefully as things, you know, proceed, we'll be able to expand and, um, we're definitely not rushing to the market on this. Uh, this is something that's been, oh, 
about nine months now in process and, and we're still a month away from actually uh, selling the product. Okay. Um, I will offer my dog Willie as a oh, test. There we go. Test case if you need a, another. We will take you dog. up on that, Eric. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Because he could use some CBD. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. So, what other concerns do you have? Well, it's you know the concerns I have right now is the things that uh, you know aside from the normal farmer concerns, the weather we understand that we're farmers we deal with it. I've been a lifelong farmer, third generation here in this farm. And I've never experienced some of the stuff, the regulate, regulatory things that frankly just seem, I'll say, unfair or they just don't make any sense. And um, so, you know, that's a big kind of a question mark out there in the future and, and to try to see and understand where this industry is going. Um, does, does USDA want this to be a legitimate crop for farmers to grow? Is the pharmaceutical industry trying to temper it? I don't know. You would think they might be, because it threatens them. And and I I understand that. But if again, if the USDA is is really at our back, they need to step in our shoes. They need to have people at the table making these rules that are farmers. And the way these rules have come out now, it's pretty obviously. It doesn't seem like there were farmers there at the table. Um, uh, so. I, I'm just saying we need to have input into this. I'm available to do that. There are plenty of good people out there to be able to get some reasonable um, common sense uh, rules for this, this plant. I mean, this plant can do so much uh, for, for our human health and we'll say animal health too. And environmental health. And environmental, there's, there's, there's yeah. so many good things about this plant. And it just seems like we're getting our hands slapped Okay, grow it, but man, you know, and, and it, or, or they're putting us in a box. Um, so there's forces that work out there. I don't even know who they all are, uh, but there is. And, you know, I want to do my part, part as a farmer to, to grow a good crop, to help others to do it. I mean, I'm just learning too. This is my second year and I'm learning a lot. I continue to and, and working with others. That's my passion to be an educator. Not that I know it all, but I want to bring people together so we can learn together. Okay. And it is frustrating. Uh, it, it feels like the, the, the government decision makers give you lip service, but very, very rarely does it seem like they really follow up and make, make change. So that's by my most frustrating rant right. uh, on this topic. All right. Well, I appreciate you having me out here. It's, it's great it's to always be. always good, Eric. And again, we appreciate, we as farmers, we, we appreciate what you're doing uh, for this industry. Well, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> So that was a pretty good tour. Thanks to Eric Trachtenberg, Cynthia Patron Hudak, and Tim Fritz and Sarah, and to Steve Groff. Appreciate your time today, helping me get reconnected to the hemp space. So. All right, so that did it. We did the hemp tour feeling better I feel more connected now to the hemp space so thanks for thanks for watching thanks for listening uh, yeah if you are listening uh, you should check out YouTube because there's a, a video on this all right my name is Eric Herlock I'm the digital editor at Lancaster Farming newspaper and uh, until next time I'll see you in the newspaper industrial hemp. Today's show was episode 101 is copyright 2020 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced, and filmed by me, Eric Harlock. And any music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. We'll be back in a few weeks with more interviews, more nuggets of hemp news, and all that stuff.